Hoops Heaven proudly brings to you Basketball Hustle, featuring your host, the writer, Chris Pike, and the scoring machine, Sean Redditch. Now it's time for another episode of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Hoops Heaven's Basketball Hustle. Coming to the business end now of the NBL season, one round to go. And things couldn't be placed in a more exciting way. We've got three teams that can still finish in the top two positions. And then we've got another three teams all fighting for the fourth and final playoff position. So plenty to dissect on this week's show. We've got a very special interview with a superstar veteran of the of the game as well. We've got a competition that we'll announce thanks to ID Athletic as well. And we'll also have a look at our award winners and we'll both both tell you who we think should win the awards at the NBL Awards Night on Sunday. So plenty to get through. Thanks to Hoop7 for making this happen. I'm Chris Pike, but the men you all want to hear from, Sean Redditch, thanks for joining me once again. Thanks, Pikey. Exciting week in uh, NBL basketball. It's going to a lot be determined. Uh, award winners, playoff positions, who's in, who's out. Uh, this is what you want coming to the business end of the year. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's let's get straight to business. So let's let's start at the top of the ladder. So we've still got the Sydney Kings and the Perth Wildcats who are fighting out over top spots. So the Kings can guarantee finishing on top if they beat the Illawarra Hawks on Friday night. But if they lose that game somehow to the Hawks, and they have lost to the Hawks already this season, then if the Perth Wildcats beat the Adelaide Thirty Sixes on Saturday at RAC Arena, depending on percentage, so they still need to make up. 39 points in terms of both how much the Kings lose by and how much they win by, but that's certainly possible. Is there any chance that the top position changes now over this final round? Oh, look, you, you can't say no, but I'm going to give it about a 2% chance <laughs> that that happens. One, I don't see the Sydney Kings losing. You yeah. know, they're going to be pretty motivated knowing, well, I think they've got top spot locked up, but you want to have a good showing going in. I suspect. They'll get Bogut some minutes, probably won't play a lot of minutes, um, and then try and work Kevin Lish into the into the game as well. So, you know, they're going to they're gonna be motivated just to, to get some confidence going into the finals, um, but I can't see the Kings dropping that one. Okay, so if the Wildcats can't finish on top, can they hold on to second spot? So as long as they beat the Adelaide 36ers, they finish second. But if they lose to Adelaide... Then if Cairns wins both of their games, they've got two road games, starting Thursday night against Melbourne United, then in Brisbane on Saturday, all, all likelihood is that they would make up that 13-point gap and take second spot. So is there any chance of that happening? Look, there, there's a slim chance, probably more of a chance of that happening than the Wildcats sure. getting top spot. You, you know, And you got to go back to the earlier game in the season. Adelaide actually beat Perth here. I think they're a... They're a team when they're playing, they've got nothing to play for mm. um, except for, you know, potentially Joey Wright's last game if, if the reports out of Adelaide are correct. Mm-hmm. And two, you've got a team that likes to run and gun. And uh, we saw Dana Johnson, 29 points, 17 rebounds against the yeah. Wildcats earlier this year. So they've got that capability. Um, I guess the other issue is Cans getting both those wins. I think the Wildcats being at home and and the way they played last week, I think that they'll get that one. But it's a, uh, you know, that's what you want. You want Cairns to have, still have a chance, get that mm-hmm. top spot, and, and put the pressure on the Wildcats to get that win on Saturday night. But most likely you think the top three will stay as it is? I think so. I think yeah. it'll be Wildcats versus Cairns, first round of, of the playoffs, and then Sydney Kings. Um, that one's still to be determined. But For I sure. kind of got the feeling that Melbourne United might have the uh, – have a shot there. Mm. I think they're kind of the front runners at this at this point if they can get that win mm-hmm. over Cairns, which is a tough one, but I think being at home will help. Okay, let's break that down then. So the top three will stay as, as it is, but we don't know who will finish fourth. So right now, the New Zealand Breakers are fourth, and they play the South East Melbourne Phoenix on Friday night, so they've got one more game to go. Then you've got the Brisbane Bullets. They've also got one game to go, and it's at home to the Cairns Taipans on Saturday, but their percentage is below that of New Zealand's. And then we've got Melbourne United. They're, they're a game behind, but they've got two games this round. So it starts Thursday night at home to Cairns and then the, the South East Melbourne Phoenix in the throwdown on Sunday. 
Yeah, I mean, nothing's guaranteed. What we will learn on Thursday night is if Melbourne's still alive or not. If they win that game, then I think you're right. I think they are in the in the box seat because their percentage is strong as well. But if they lose to Cairns on Thursday night, then I think they're pretty much done because I can't see any way in the world of the New Zealand Breakers losing to a Phoenix team minus Mitch Creek in Christchurch with the way the Breakers are playing right now. So basically, I think the bullets are out of the running, but... All of it's going to come down to what happens, I think, in the Thursday night game to start the round. Yeah, I think it is right. That one, uh, that one's going to be huge. Melbourne just needs to find a way to win, and uh, and and obviously the Wildcats will be rooting for that. But I think the kicker here with with Melbourne United is that they will know, bearing if they get that win against against Kansas, they will know how much they need to beat mm. the Phoenix by in that final game to yeah. get in. So it will be uh it'll be an interesting one you're right with which mitch creek not playing that helped the new zealand breakers but also yep. helps melbourne united sure. potentially as well and how does southeast melbourne phoenix play this one as well mm-hmm. i mean if you're the crosstown rival you, you don't want them getting into the finals so mm-hmm. they're gonna have a little bit extra motivation there in that final game um are they gonna give some of their young guys a little bit more of a run you know, maybe we'll see Terry Armstrong a little bit more. We haven't really seen him all season. Right. So, you know, maybe maybe they'll put some word out to the NBA scouts. Hey, we're going to get Terry Armstrong a little bit of a run yeah. and see how he goes against two potential playoff teams. It's um, it's going to be an interesting, you know, the fact that Southeast Melbourne Phoenix has to play both these two teams that we think are, are in the running makes it uh, makes it a little bit more intriguing as well. So it's, uh, you know, I still think Melbourne United being the most talented has, has a shot, but, you know, mm-hmm. I've discounted the breakers for the probably the last two months and they, they've proven me wrong. So maybe uh, maybe one more week they'll, they'll prove me wrong again. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating and, do do you think agree that Brisbane's out of the running? They do need results to go to go their way. Even if they beat Cairns on Saturday, then they need some help because I don't think they'll be able to leapfrog New Zealand on percentage. So they'll need the Phoenix to upset the the Breakers, and then they need Melbourne to also they need Melbourne to to lose one of the two games as well. So do you think the Bullets are pretty much pretty much done? Yeah, I think it's going to be tough because they're playing Cairns as well. Um, but then then again, if Cairns lose to Melbourne, they kind of know where they're going to sit. They don't have a whole, whole lot to play for in that last one. Do they risk some of their stars and not risk, you know, on the back-to-back game? It's a, uh, you know, a lot of rods on that, that kind of Melbourne-Cairns game. Um, and then potentially how Perth goes on that Saturday as well. So it, it's a tough one, but I can't see Brisbane getting in. And, and it's a shame. I kind of thought, you know, they were the hottest team in the league. They won six in a row. This time, and then it was that only this lost, time last week. That loss to New Zealand yeah. was was the tough one. And they had their chances against the, against the Wildcats last week as, as well. They played extremely well for three quarters. And just at that game, it just felt like, Brisbane kind of ran out of legs, you know, in that end of the third quarter, they started missing free throws, missed a few layups. And to me, that's the sign of playing that back to back, having to travel West. Um, If it had been their first game of the round, it might've been a lot closer there at the end and and had a shot to win it. So it's unfortunate the schedule Mm -hmm. for them, you know, went against them in that, uh, because I thought they played extremely hard. It, It felt like a, a playoff game yeah, in the atmosphere and how hard the two teams were playing, um, which was fun to see. I just think they just ran out of gas and ran out of legs. And, yeah. you know, you can't really compensate for that. There's nothing you can do. That's just the, you know, Wildcats are fresh and they, uh, they, you know, they just didn't have as uh, enough in the tank to get over a, a Wildcat team playing at home. Very quickly, let's just run through the, the scores from, from last week. Thanks to Hoops Heaven. Head to hoopsheaven.com.au to get all of your basketball merchandise. And don't forget to use the special code word thanks to their support of us here on the show, Hustle, when you go to the checkout and and the team will take take care of you there. So head to hoopsheaven.com.au for that. As we touched on on the show last week, Brisbane Bullets, 87, lost to the New Zealand Breakers. That game was massive, 91. That game was massive on the Friday night to set up this final round. Then we saw Melbourne United, probably as you'd expect, 95, 72 winners over the Illawarra Hawks. Probably also as you'd expect, given Adelaide's season's over, the Kansas Taipans going to Adelaide and getting the 99-80 to victory. 
And then in a, in a cracker, which delayed the game in Perth significantly because it went to overtime, the Sydney Kings beat the South East Melbourne Phoenix 99-96, to which pretty much guarantees them top spot. And then we saw, to finish things off on Sunday, as you, as you have already touched on, the Perth Wildcats beating the Brisbane Bullets 85-72. to What stood out to you from, from last weekend? Yeah, well, that Sydney Kings game was an interesting one, and mm. we were waiting there at, at the Wildcats, <laughs> waiting for, for them to start. And everyone was kind of crouched around this TV watching <laughs> the uh, the end of that game, and um, you know they they had had their chances to to knock off uh, the Sydney Kings, but unfortunately um, for the Wildcat fans, and um, they they weren't able to, and, and it delayed the game as well. There with the yeah. um, with the Wildcats, uh, you know, that, as a player, you're always frustrated. You kind of got your timing, you know, when you're warming up, 15 minutes thrown out there on the clock, and then all of a sudden they, they throw another 15 minutes up there, and you've got to uh, you got to figure out a new routine as far as getting into the game. So it kind of threw threw the teams off. They weren't too happy about that. I'm not sure the best solution there in, in that scenario. Possibly even just start the game and, and come to it kind of mid midway mm-hmm. through the first quarter when the other one finishes. But um, but they chose to to hold it, and uh, you know, I don't think it affected the game too much. But you, you, uh, as a player, you just want to you want to know when the game's going to start. So Sydney Kings uh, really dodged a bullet there, but yeah. you know they, they've done what they've done all season, and I think they're the first team to start the year at top of the ladder and finish the top of the ladder. So yeah, potentially yeah. Um, is uh, credit to them and, and Will Weaver and, and what he's been able to do at Sydney this year. I wanted to ask you about that delay to the start of the game because you were you were meticulous in your routine and your planning probably more than any other player I've seen. A five-minute delay you can deal with, a 25-minute delay, how much would have that thrown you off before a game? Yeah, it would just would have been it would have been frustrating. Yeah. And you know, yeah, I think you're right. Five minutes, you might get something happen happen there. But when it goes, uh, when you're waiting that much time to uh, to get going, it didn't affect Tariko White at the start. He came out and had that mm-hmm. huge dunk. Uh, yeah, we didn't yeah. really see him the rest of the game. A great great start for him. It's a. Uh, it, I, I'd like to. I'd like him just to start the game and just come. TV wise, maybe even throw the game, uh, you know, down, minimize it on the other side, or just have the score for those yeah, that are that. tuning in. Obviously, you I don't do want to leave. NBA games. Yeah, you don't want to leave the the Sydney game. Um, you no. obviously want to keep that one on TV, but then just come over when uh, when they're ready. You know, we had we had taped a great opener piece, <laughs> a couple great interviews, but uh, we didn't get to show those, oh, no. the, which, which was fun. But it was, um, yeah, I would just like to see them start the game straight away. The only potential problem is that now that the way the commentary is set up, I imagine it's the same commentary team. Does that make things harder to have a team ready to cross straight to, to, a, to a, a game that's already started because the commentary team would have missed the start of a game? Yeah, it's a good point, and one I probably hadn't thought about too much now that with, the, with the change of things. I think the other thing is they've got the same producers as yep. well for the yep. for the first game it is with the second game as well. So that probably makes it a little bit difficult. So I'm sure there's there's some things that they'll they'll try and work out and, and figure out a better solution. Usually at the end of a game, you have 10, 15 minutes where mm-hmm. you got to do interviews and stuff. But I think that Sydney game, everyone was using their timeouts. It just kind of yeah. went long anyways. And then so it just affected the the, the Wildcats and, and Brisbane game as well. Moving forward, do we just need to have a two and a half hour window for games? Is that the simplest solution? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I like, I mean, I want to sit down and watch a game and then go straight into the sure. next game. I yeah. don't want to yeah. listen to a half hour of, of interviews and yeah. then that. I want to, uh, you know, as a viewer, I want to go straight into the next game. I just think you could, if they can work it as far as production wise and stuff, let's just, you know, it happens as an overtime game. Well, that's a bonus. Well, but, and we, maybe we missed the first couple minutes of the other game and they, the, the, they can fill you in on what, what happened in those first couple minutes yeah, um, sure. when they cross over so to me that that that's what i would prefer i'm not sure that that can happen but you know i the, the friday nights especially are are the tough ones because you don't want to start the game too late as yeah. well yeah. um you know 6 30 time slot over 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 west is is really good especially with with families and, and stuff not wanting to have the game too late so yeah. i think it, it it's a delicate one but you know it's something that you're going to probably have to look have to look at potentially 
Now, let's move on to our interview for this week, Sean. I caught up with Mika Vakona, somebody that your career ran amazing parallels with because you were you were teammates at the New Zealand Breakers, which I think a lot of people people forget, and then you became great rivals in when the Perth Wildcats were battling the New Zealand Breakers, and, and Mick is happy to admit that you're his great rival of, of his career, and you, and you always will be. He's happy to admit that even when he sees you now, and he saw you last Sunday, that he's a little bit intimidated by you, and he has a look over, and he wants to go and say hello to you, but he's a bit scared of going to say hello because he doesn't think you'll want to talk to him. So it's amazing to think that he's the greatest warrior that I've ever seen play in the NBL over the last 15 years that I've been watching, but you still intimidate him. How does that make you feel? Yeah, I don't know about uh, intimidation <laughs> there. It's, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, that's the first time I've probably heard that. I think uh, anyone's intimidated when they when they know that they're going to have to match it with Mika Bacona. Um, just the, uh, you know, people talk about being the ultimate warrior and, and, you know, credit the New Zealand Breakers for giving him the opportunity and putting him into the right spot. You know, probably something that people don't give Andre Lamontis too much credit for. But, you know, when Mika Bacona was with the Breakers when I was first there, he was a development player. They were playing him at the three spot. No one could keep him off the glass, but that wasn't his best position. You know, they were trying to get him to play outside, learn to shoot the three. But when they moved him to that four and actually had him and Dylan Boucher in those mm-hmm. in that four spot in their their heydays, I mean, you know, numbers wise, but those guys just affected the games in so many different ways. And, uh, you know, for the for the New Zealand Breakers to recognize that, Andre Lamanis to see that, hey, how can we utilize this guy who is relentless defender? You know, I mean, I haven't seen too many foremen that can pick up a point guard full court and just turn him about four or five times um, and, and do it to do it with the incredible um, intensity is uh, is something. And then on the other end, you just could not box him out. I mean, it was almost to the point you had to foul him to try and box him out. And hopefully the rest didn't call it <laughs> when uh, when you're drawn. But, uh, you know, I just all all tremendous amount of respect and uh now that i know that i'll make sure i uh go up and uh have yeah. a good good chat with with mika I don't uh you know i think we had so many good battles out on the court and we're such competitive players that we're, you know now that i'm sure you know he's coming to the towards the end of his career that that when we look back on it there's um there's tremendous amount of respect and admiration for what each other's uh, been able to to do and accomplish and i think we both made each other better players he, he, he readily admits that you drove him to be the player and competitor that he was. So you, you, there's no doubt that your, your careers were massively paralleled and, yeah, it, it, it'll be a great journey to, to put into a book one day. So let's, let's hope we can, we, can, we, can, we can do that, Sean. So let's, let's get to the chat now. He's now playing with the Brisbane Bullets, so he's preparing to play the Cairns Taipans this week and he's still holding out hope that, that, he, that his team can, can make the playoffs and he's also hoping he can do something else that you did, Sean, and become an Olympian later this year. So we, we talk about that in this chat. So let's get to it now. Mika Vakona here on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. Okay, we're very honoured to be joined by Mika Vakona here this week on, on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. I'm not sure how he feels about being on a show co-hosted by Sean Redditch, but here we are anyway. Um, Mika Vakona, as you prepare for a massive game on Saturday night, how do I find you this week? Yeah, good, man. Good. Uh, obviously, it's a big weekend for a lot of teams, especially us. And um, mm. yeah, just gearing up for it really after a uh, tough week last week. Yeah, looking forward to Saturday's game against Cairns. When you hear that you're appearing on a on a podcast co-hosted by Sean Reddidge, your longtime foe and probably the greatest rival of your career, what runs through your mind? <laughs> yeah, good question. When you asked me, I was like, oh, <laughs> maybe, no. Nah. Everything was left on the court and I got a lot of respect for Sean and what he did during his time. And um, look, I, there was a lot of admiration from afar, but it was always a lot of respect. And it was like, oh man, here we go again. We're going to go lock horns again. So um, no, no, mm. really happy to uh, come on board today. He's come to interview you um, on the court since he's been in the in the commentary chair as well. Has that been a little bit strange over the last couple of years? Uh, I guess when he first initially retired, it was a little bit weird just because you've been so used to seeing him on the court and going against him. But yeah. Uh, just hearing him uh, on court, being the court announcer, it's actually really refreshing. You know, he's, I think he's really good at his job and um, what he does on the commentary box. So uh, it's actually pretty good just to hear him. So uh, I think he's got a long future there if he wants it. 
now. I'm sure he'll be he'll be happy to hear that. Um, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, let's move on. Mick, as you touched on, tough week last week. This time last week, you were the hottest team in the league on a six game winning streak, and all of a sudden you lose those two games last week to New Zealand and Perth, and and I guess suddenly destiny's out of your own hands. Is that does that make it for a, a bit of a tough week when I guess you know that you have to re- rely on other results now? Yeah, I mean, but look, I think prior to our six-game winning streak, um, we needed to win those games, you know? Um, yep, sure. And the results is just, I guess, a reflection of what this league is and how the teams are going and how close it is and how competitive and how um, high class it is. So, look, it is it is what it is. We're disappointed with that it happened, but we've had to put that in our back pocket and move on real quickly because obviously you can't do that with a uh, tough team like Ken's coming on. What do you do for a game like tonight when Melbourne plays plays Cairns and and I guess you know t- tomorrow night as well when you have to rely on the results? Do you watch those games? Do you try to ignore the results? How do you how do you approach it personally? Look, I'll have a I'll keep an eye on it. I'm not too worried yeah. how they go because you can't control them. You know, uh, one of my things sure. is control only what you can control because you can't control anybody else's feelings or how they go about things. Um, that's always been something that I've gone. And, gone with over my career and um, mm-hmm. look we just need to win and however yep. many points that is um, we'll find out by the time we start playing on Saturday um, but yeah it'll be more interesting just to see how things go um, but you know I have a lot of confidence in our team and it's just seeing how many we need to win by because we just need to win yeah absolutely given the way you're playing and given you know, that six-game winning streak, you were playing as well as anybody in the league. And even though you lost those two games last week, you still didn't play badly. Are you pretty confident if you do find a way to make the finals that you can have a real impact? Totally, totally. You know, this is a great group of guys that we got in, in the change room. You know, everybody's had that belief from day one. We had a rough start. Um, but the last, I guess, that six-game winning streak uh, showed how close we are as a team. Um, we have a lot of belief. We've got a lot of key pieces. Lamar's playing exceptionally. Um, we've got Sobe coming mm-hmm. in. He's doing a great job. Jace is doing an awesome job. I mean, look, I could keep rattling. Even um, Taylor, EJ, um, yeah. you know, Hodgie. Uh, obviously, Will Magno having a breakout season. Look, these are guys that, mm-hmm. are, that have a lot of confidence and we know what we can do. And it's just like, look, we just couldn't put the ball in the hoop against New Zealand down the stretch. And same thing, you, you know, third, fourth quarter, um, Perth showed its class and we just couldn't put it in. So look, we have a co- lot of confidence in what we can do and that's the same kind of com- confidence we'll go into on Saturday. You touched on Lamar. How good is he? Do we realise from the outside perhaps how good he is or do you get a, a, an extra bit of a glimpse by seeing him up close every, every, every day? Every day. I mean, this is a guy that's a true mm-hmm. professional. Obviously, to, as an example, you know, um, he still bikes the training. Obviously, it was to get himself into shape at the start of the season, but he's continued that. He's always looking for an edge yeah. to become better, and he's just so tough. He is a gift for scoring, and um, mm-hmm. and his calm poise, and I guess his experience really shows when he's playing out there. So, look, uh, we rely on him a lot, um, but also he's a great team guy. You know, involves everybody. Everybody gets along with him, and, um, yeah, like you said, we get a glimpse every day of how special he is, and, um, you know, it's, it's pretty cool to be part of what about Will Bagno? How good is he and how good can he be going forward? Ceiling's unlimited for him, you know. Yeah. He's, uh, he's an awesome, awesome kid. And I think I've talked about him before to somebody else and it's just his temperament is spot on, I think, for what he's been exposed to. to uh, you know, he just takes it on and he says, look, if it happens, it happens, but I'm just going to enjoy it and just keep working. You know, he works every day on his, on his craft and, you know, whatever comes at him, he's just level-headed and I think at a young age it's such a cool thing to, uh, to watch or witness and obviously everybody sees his block shots his ability to play defense from you know from two to five uh-huh. and um, even one you know so he's um, yeah it's it's really cool to watch and um, yeah um, we'll continue to watch it I wanted to ask you about your coach too Andre um, in a lot of ways it's been a really tough year for him obviously he lost the, the lost the boomers job and and for some reason, there's been criticism the whole way through about this group that he's put together at the Bullets. But I think if you look at the way that you're finishing the season, he's been vindicated in the group that he put together and and he showed a lot of faith in the players. And I think it's it's shown that he's done the right thing given you're still a really good chance to play finals and you're playing your best basketball now at the end of the season. Um, how, 
have you had to spend extra time with him to to sort of make sure that he still felt good about his coaching this year or has, has anything changed in your relationship with him given everything that he's had to deal with this year? Um, you, you know what? He's become more and more open as the season has carried him. Yeah. You know, um, his communication lines have opened up in terms of that. Um, everybody's uh-huh. had their part to, I guess, talk to him um, and see what he's thinking. Um, in terms of, I don't think he lost his job in the booms. I think he decided no, to sure, uh, sure. walk away from no, yeah, yeah, sure. walk away from that. But um, look, that's a high pressure job. You know, you got a lot of mm. top talent. And expectations was very high. I still think that's an awesome place to come. You know, fourth, I know you guys wanted to get medals, but, mm. you know, world champs, it's, it's the top of the cream, you know, um, yep, yep. in terms of that. But, look, it's – I think it's also an indication of how close this group is. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. no one knew what we would get, uh, what we had at the start of the season and just the fact that everybody was able to stay close and communicate and just – you know, just uh, work through it as a um, true indication of how close this team is and how he was able to, uh, I guess, lead the team. Um, I've always had belief in Andre and what he's been able to do, and that's yeah. what made me come back to here, to Brisbane. Yeah. Not back to Brisbane, but back to him and yeah. TJ and um, and Rich. So, um, no, mm-hmm. I think it'll just uh, get better. Speaking of your move to Brisbane, two years into it now, um from everything that I, I can see and hear, it looks like your family are really happy there. Mm-hmm. That was a big reason you, you went there because your relationship with CJ and, and his family, so you had you had that bond there. Two years into that move, are you, are you really happy that you, you made it? Yeah, totally, man. Look, um, every decision for myself and my wife is uh, we always think about it a lot. And, um, you know, true indication of, of it being a good move is how – good the kids have really adapted to it you know um the kids have really opened up and they're totally enjoying their environment and you know i guess as parents it's it's easy it's easy to adapt to any any city when your kids uh open it up with open arms you know accept it sorry and um yeah you know it's we're a family that uh never say no to anything um but we're also Mm -hmm. uh very open to anything so look um right now this is brisbane and um yeah, it's uh, we're loving it. Looking at the next week, are you committed to playing in the Tall Blacks games even if you make the playoffs? Or if you make playoffs, will you just need to, to take a bit of a break and, and get ready for, for the NBL finals? No, I'm re- rearing to go, man. So uh, okay, yeah, well, yeah. I'm going to play the Tall Blacks. I missed out during the World Cup because of injuries. So um, yeah. as you know, I love representing the Blake jersey and obviously first time mm. with uh, Piero Cameron as a head coach yep. so that's going to be uh, pretty awesome and um, nah definitely putting my hand up for that regardless of whether or not we are in the finals or in the playoff hunt Does Ruben feel similar and, and is that something that the bond between you two is that something that you talk about a lot how proud you are to continue to play for New Zealand you know beyond what you're doing at, at Brisbane Yeah I mean it's, it's pretty cool I mean um, just been able to talk about your thoughts and of how you want to play for your country and things like that. And it's always on the back of our mind that any opportunity that we get, we will put our hand up for. Um, it's, it's something that I know it's quite fleeting and any time you get it, it's a big honour. And it's also myself talking to him every day about it. It's, uh, it's, it's a good thing. You know, it's great just to mm. keep that bond, especially with both of us being over here, just to reconnect with the, your New Zealand roots is um, pretty important to both of us. So, having those constant conversations about the Tall Blacks, about who's in the team, the coaches, things like that, it's um, mm. it's refreshing. Are you pretty confident you can end up getting to the Olympics throughout the path that you have to have to go through this year? Yeah, we always back ourselves. You know, results might not always mm. go our way, but shoot, um, that's what this culture of the Tall Blacks is all built on, you know, is on, in the confidence in the team, you know, in the confidence yep. in that we uh, work as one, um, and, you know, we try and, I guess, punch above, above our weight. Um, those that came before us, uh, you know, we try and honour those from the present and those uh, for the future is something that the Tall Black motto is based around and, um, yeah, is what we try and live up to. How much of a highlight would that be if you can end up at the Olympics later this year? 
unbelievable. You know, that's one thing that yeah. I'd love to do for myself personally is to tick that box yeah. off. And I think that's one of the driving forces as to why I still continue to play in the Tall Blacks mm. is I still haven't been able to do that. Um, I've been to World Champs, yeah. Commonwealth, other tournaments, but the Olympic is one thing I uh, haven't been able to tick off. So um, I'd love to do that mm. and uh, I'd love to be part of that team. In terms of the, your NBL future, I, I would assume while this season's still going, it's it's something that you don't want to make a decision on. But when do you when do you decide on if you want to play on next year or not? And do you wait for the club to come to you, or do you simply just want to wait until this season's over, let the dust settle, and, and then see what's happening? Pretty much that. Just wait till the season's over and uh, let the dust sure. settle and go from there. Do you feel like you would like to play on, or is it something that you just don't want to think about right now? Probably don't want to think about it right now. You know, as athletes. You- <laughs> You never try and think too far ahead, as yeah, silly as it sounds sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're more worried about, okay, what's your next game? You know, and those are things right now I'm trying to focus on. Is the is it a good thing at this point in your career, you know, with everything you've achieved that you've still got goals? You, you, you talked about how you haven't been to an, an Olympics and that's something you want to achieve. And, you know, I'm, there's a lot of stuff in Brisbane that you can still achieve that the, the boards haven't done for, for a long time. The fact that even though you've been playing for as long as you have, the fact that there's still things to achieve, that must be something that, that makes sure that your motivation levels just never, never drop off. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I think you answered it in that question, really. It's um, mm-hmm. being able to find goals. And it's anytime you're searching for goals in a career of anything, I feel, uh, is probably the time you need to move away from it. And the fact that all these goals just keep popping up without me trying to instigate it, um, mm. you know, um, I feel it, it for me is the right thing. It's easy when you have talent such as Magnates coming through, Tyrell Harrison's in, in Brisbane, you know, popping yeah. up. Um, you, you're fighting against 17 year olds you know it's it's like man mm-hmm. you always got something to prove you know not only to yourself but mm-hmm. to the coaching staff to to guess the fans and that and say look I can still play and um, I think every yeah. athlete has it and I think it's just the art of just deciding okay when is the right time to move away you know um, and right now with the body feeling good uh, the mind's great mm-hmm. it's yeah you just want to keep pushing through just finally away from basketball as well what's it like now being a dad and seeing your kids grow up, they're starting to, they're starting to to get to get to some decent ages as well, and, and they're starting to sort of, you know, form their own lives. What's it like as a dad seeing seeing your kids grow up into the people that they are? Scary, man. It really is because um, <laughs> they start to reflect who you are as parents, right? So um, yeah, sure. All of a sudden, you see, I'm seeing a little mini me in terms of my wife walking around, you know, and it's like, mm. oh shoot, you know. You become more, <laughs> you become more. Um, what's the word? You try and pick and choose what you're saying now because the kids are like. Yeah. I mean, they are sponges from such a young age, but then you actually physically see it, you know, in front of you, and it's like, okay, look, you got to hold up, try and see what you're doing, um, try and give them stuff that you think will help them, um, but also it's it's an amazing time because then you really start conversating with them, and then. You know, you start having these discussions that you never have been able to do, you know. Mm. Um, for me, it's a rewarding and um, probably one of the best things that I guess, I think my wife would say the same thing, the best thing that we've ever done is these kids, Jira and Noah, yeah. and um, it's something that I hold true to my heart and it's great just to see them be able to see me play still and, and it's one of those driving yeah, forces sure. that, you know, after a game, they're down there um, and, you know, something that, for as a sportsman, it's not long, but to have the opportunity to have your kids actually watch you play is, I think, priceless. So I'm pretty blessed to still be able to play and for them to see it and then for them to actually want to play it. Um, it's, mm. it's cool as a father. And, uh, um, no, nah, I'm just I'm really looking forward to spending even more time um, over the next yeah. few years. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks a lot for joining us here on the show, Mika. And, you know, I've been in and around the league for, for 15 years now and I've – I've never made a secret of the fact, and I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you right now, that you've been my favourite player just for just for the, the way you go about things and the admiration that I've got for you just couldn't be higher. And I think everyone that's watched your play feels that way. So thanks very much for giving up, up your time to have a chat to us here and let's hope this week pans out well for you. I appreciate it, Chris. I'm also a big fan of yours as well, man. Thank you.
Okay, thanks, thanks to Mika Vakona for that interview, and I hope you all enjoyed it. He's he's just the ultimate NBL competitor, so let's hope that you all enjoyed getting a little bit of insight from him. Now, Sean, um, I want to put you on the spot a little bit. Mika's not sure on his future, but let's also tie in Damien Martin and David Barlow into this discussion. Do you expect to see it? Any of those three, all of those three, some of those three still playing next season? That's a tough one. Um, mm. You know, I probably a few weeks ago wasn't sure about Damian Martin with the injury and stuff. He, he actually looked and was moving pretty good in the uh, in, in his comeback game against Brisbane on Saturday. So mm-hmm. I'll leave that one open. Um, and I haven't had that discussion with him. Yeah. I think it's something that, uh, you know, in his own time and he'll know, he'll know when it's right. Um, Mika, I, it, it just depends on what type of role he's willing, mm. he's willing to play. I mean, he's always kind of been that 20, 25 minute, just go out there and play as hard as he can. And, you know, he's happy to play that role this year, but is he willing to do that again? for another season or two. Yep. Um, obviously he's from New Zealand being away from home. That's a, uh, that, 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 that's a tough one. I probably would say the one most likely to play on would be David Barlow. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just because I think he, you know, he hasn't had as good a year as he had last year, but I still think there's value in him there with Melbourne United. So I would say Barlow's the most likely. Yep. And um, and then for me, it's it's Mika, you know, what type of role he's going to have going forward. And also Damian Martin, just to, it's just more his body. You know, is yep. he going to be able to withhold another NBL season? Um, and does he want to? So, you know, those are the questions they, they can only ask. And you probably get a better idea when um, when they finish it, you know, if I'm Mika Vacona or if I'm New Zealand Breakers, and let's say Mika Vacona does retire this year, I would like to see the New Zealand Breakers sign him to a one day contract and have him retire as a New Zealand Breaker. That'd be great. Um, That'd I be think fantastic. you know, th- I think he's do that. What he yep. brought to that club and what he meant to that team, um, you know, they uh, they played the way Mika Vacona you know, led them and not, you know, Mika Vacona is not the vocal leader. He's just Mm -hmm. more going to get out there and show you. And when he was on the court, it was, you you know, you wanted that guy on your team. So Mm -hmm. um, I hope the Zealand Breakers do the right thing because he's, uh, he's been tremendous for, for that club. Yeah. That'd be great to see. Great to see. Okay. Let's move on. Last week we had a look at the NBL award nominees and we broke down each category into who we thought were the major contenders. But now the awards night is this Sunday, following the, the last game of the regular season in Melbourne. So now let's put our put our heads on the chopping block, Sean, and pick our winners for, for each award. Let's start with the MVP award. Um, we we narrowed it down last year, and I think we last week, and we both agreed that it's down to Lamar Patterson, Scott Machado, and Bryce Cotton. Scotty Hobson, an outside chance, but probably not just because he missed those seven games, can't quite win it. Who who have you got taking it taking out the Andrew Gaze trophy? Oh, I think I've, I've got Bryce Cotton uh, taking it out. I think uh, you know I think he's the most important player to the, those teams. It, and with a close second, Scott Machado, what yep. uh, what uh, he's been able to do with Cans, I just think, um, and maybe just living out west and knowing Bryce Cotton, maybe I'm a little bit biased here, but. You know, that's the, you got to have an opinion. And, and mm-hmm. my opinion is Bryce Cotton's the best player in the league. And he's, uh, he, he's worthy of the MVP this year. Yeah, well, uh, I have no case against it except to say that I'm tipping Scott Machado. But I think it's just such a toss of the coin between him and Bryce Cotton. I think Lamar Patterson is just one step behind them. He's ever so close. And then I think a step behind him is Scotty Hobson, but only because he missed missed those seven or eight games. So I'm going for Machado, but I, I think it's a toss of the coin. And I would actually feel feel for Bryce because I think to not get an MVP award this season or last season, I think he deserved at least one more to his to his to add to his cabinet. So I think I think he'll he'll be unlucky to cut, to finish runner up this year. But I mean, I, we have to pick somebody. So so lo- like you, I I'm, I'm going to pick him. But I just think it's such a toss of the coin, and and it's pretty exciting that we've got two guys of that caliber that we can't split. Yeah, it is. And, and to me, maybe, you know, some of those Cam Oliver and DJ Newble steal yeah. some votes from Scott Machado oh, as well, yeah. because they, they've had outstanding seasons. 
Um, and, you know, Cam Oliver, we saw 31 points last weekend. DJ Newble has just been consistent and yeah. and just taking his game to another level. So he might steal – those guys might steal a few votes from Scott. Um, the other thing that – and we haven't really talked about it, but if, let's say Bryce Cotton does win the MVP – his first season comes in halfway through the Wildcats are last place to go on to win the championship. His grand final MVP next year. He wins the MVP last year. They win the championship. He, you know, could have easily won the MVP. If he wins it again this year, is this quite possibly the greatest stretch by a Wildcat player over four years that, that we've seen? It'd be tough to tough to um, to say no to that. I think yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a great great discussion to have. And and you said it before that he's the. I think him and James Ennis. I think you were tossing up between the two best that you you had ever ever played with. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you'd have to say it's the best four years of a Wildcats player. And then you have to start to have the discussion: How long does he have to continue it for before he rivals Ricky Grace to be the greatest Wildcats player ever? Yeah, I mean that's a it's a longevity thing there. Yeah. Um, you know he's he's still got a number of years years to go, but um, if he continues at this pace, pool? it's uh, you, yeah. you know I, I kind of liken it to like I never saw thought LeBron James would get to the level of Michael Jordan, but now it, it's a, it's an actual debate, you know, and yeah, so it um, it's a uh, you know let's let's hope for uh, for the NBL and the Wildcats point of view that Brian, we do get to that point where mm. we are discussing uh, him and Ricky as, yep. as the greatest. Absolutely. Most improved player. Now, this was really tough last week when we had to even narrow it down to who our candidates were. So it's going to be even tougher to, to name one winner. Oh, I'm going to let you go first, Sean. Who do you think? Well, I have a tough one. and oh, it's, it's been a tough one. My three, I'm going to say Penno. Bruce and Magne, and I'm going to go with Penno just because of, you know, I think he's he's been a starter this year. He's put up some ridiculous numbers, you know, uh, rebounding games especially. And um, so, you know, and, and from where he was last year where he was hardly playing, obviously behind the MVP, Andrew Bogut, I'm going to go with him uh, winning it. But, you know, it's, it's definitely not a, an easy decision. There, There's quite a few candidates there. I'm going to agree with you, Sean. I'm going to go with Dane Pino as well, just because the sheer volume of performance he's put together for the whole season, he's turned into being the starting center center for the Phoenix, and they had an import center at the start of the season, Keith Benson, but he, he just completely pl- outplayed him to the point where they just had to let him go because he had no, no value to the team. So f- going from somebody who was just playing way behind Andrew Bogut last year to now becoming a genuine center in this league, I think Dane Pino is my winner, but yeah, I mean, Sean Bruce, Will Magne, Sunday Dash are all, all highly unlucky. Yeah. My, my most improved during the season has to be Will Magne. I mean, mm. uh, you know, he was hardly playing at the start and by yeah. the end he's, he's, uh, he's starting. He's, you know, we've seen games where he's six blocks a game. He's just, uh, he, he, he's an intimidating factor. And, it, you know, when I watched that game, the Wildcats first Brisbane, that's kind of the first time I've seen him play a lot of minutes live. And, uh, and he's an even better player live than, uh, than I probably realized. Just the little things he does and the presence he has out there on the court. Um, I, I was really impressed with him. So I like the future of Will Magne. I'm, I'm excited mm-hmm. to see where, where he ends up. You know, you know, people talk about the NBA. I think that's a, that is a ceiling he could get to. I think so too. Best six man. I, so who, who do we, who, who have you gone with? I'm still up and, you know, it's it's such a tough one because, the, you know, you, you'll watch a Clint Stondel, he'll have a big game and then you'll yep. have a couple quiet ones. Uh, you know, Kadi as well, Adnam, Bruce mm. has been real solid all year. You know, I, I like what Kicker, Kick It brings. Yep. Um, I'm going to go with Sean Bruce just because I feel like he's been solid. He hasn't needed a score all, all year. He's shot the ball extremely well, and he's been pretty handy for the top team in the competition. So that's who I'm going to pick. But it's uh, that's probably the toughest one I've had to pick um, out, of the, out of these awards. Yeah, I agree because I think Jason Kadee has a really, really strong case. Um, and the, the longer the season's gone on, Daniel Kickett has a stronger case too just because he's had to play – a bigger and bigger role with the less and less minutes Andrew Bogut's been playing, but I guess if you if you're looking at it from King's point of view, you have to you only have one sixth man on your team. So 
I'm going to go with Sean Bruce just because I don't think if he hadn't played the role that he had that they could have covered Kevin Lish the way the way that they have. So he's done such a great job stepping in for Kevin Lish and he's been so consistent. And I think he's very unlucky not to have got the most improved player award. And I just think he deserves at least one award for this season. So I'm going to go with Sean Bruce as well. Defensive player of the year. Now, last week I said that I think it's uh, the easiest choice for me to make, and I'm still going to stick with stick with that. But I think you might have might be weighing up a few a few other players too. Yeah, I, I, you know, I do like um, I do like Will Magne. Um, mm-hmm. I do like Sunday Detch that how hard he plays, and and Cam Oliver as well, and, mm-hmm. and Newble. So those kind of my four. Yeah. Um, it, it's a tough one. I'm going to go with Cam Oliver just because I feel like he can rebound and block shot and just a, just a real presence under there and has some big time. Uh, but I, I really debate, uh, you know, going between Newble and Oliver there for it. But uh, I'm going to go with Cam Oliver. Yeah, I'm going to stick with DJ Newble just because I think he's been given all of the biggest jobs on the scoring guards in the league. And I think he's done the best job out of everybody on... Bryce Cotton on Casper Ware, on Jerome Randall, even even Melo Trimble has done a good job on. And then also the job that he did on Scotty Hobson was the best defensive job we've seen on him. And the fact that he's also taking the pressure off Scotty Machado having to do that job, I think that's had flow-on effects to the team as well. So, yeah, I mean, I'm going to stick with DJ. But what does it say about the Taipans that we feel like the two top best defensive players in the year candidates both come from come from their team? Yeah, I mean, it says uh, they've done a really good job recruiting. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think Mike Kelly had talked about being a great offensive team. Um, but, I, you know, be able to have those guys to be able to defend the paint and, and play the way that they need to to be successful is a, uh, a credit to them. And, you know, hopefully for, for Can's sake that they can uh, keep those guys around for the future because it's an exciting future for that club. Yeah, Rookie of the Year, hi. Similar to the best six men, I don't really like the fact that we can include the next stars in this category. I would prefer it to be just for local players, but I think the fact that the next stars are included and and probably because Coat Noy ended up missing so so long with his ankle injury, I think I think Lamelo Ball is the standout. But if not, if it was going to a local, then I think Coat Noy would be the standout. But I just think it it has to be Lamelo Ball, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it'll win it. For sure. I mean, they, yeah. they've heard that that was engraved probably five games into the year. I think if he was <laughs> if he was eligible, um, you're right. Kawat Noy is probably the most put up the biggest numbers out of there. The other one that I might throw in there, and you know, I just don't think he's had enough. But I think potential wise, is Sam Frawling. Yeah, for sure. I, I've liked when he's got the minutes, um, but he just hasn't had that as much opportunity. He was injured as well for a little bit. RJ Hampton's had some some good games, but nowhere near the impact that Lamelo Ball had. So yeah, I think it's something the league might want to revisit. Is the next star? Is that considered a, a rookie of the year? I kind of like to see it go to uh, you know a, a local player rather than than an import. Um, from the next star program. Well, I think not that you want to decide because of this reason, but for example, it it would mean a lot more to Court Noy to win it than it would to Lamelo Ball, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's going to look good on Lamelo Ball's resume, but would yeah, he even, would he even put it on his resume? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> well, uh, he won't be there to accept it. I don't think no, uh, no. from from all accounts. But no. Kawat Noy, yeah, I think I would like to see that because then you know he's going to be in the league for a long time. They're saying, oh, former NBL Rookie of the Year Kawat Noy. Now yeah. is he? Uh, now can he make that jump to being an All NBL team? Um, yeah. Or can he be the sixth man? Can he? You know, what what's his? progression from there we've seen you know jesse wagstaff as a, a guy for example who's yeah. who won rookie of the year and, and be able to carve out a really nice career from that and you know i think when he looks back on his career he's going to be quite proud that he was rookie of the year so i'd like to see them revisit that will they i don't know i, I love the next stars program i just don't like it from uh rookie of the year standpoint like we did when we did our picks mid-season and also at the start of the season, maybe they just need a best next star player award. Maybe that's just the best way to go. Yeah, that's a good idea, especially if you get more. I mean, we've yeah. had um, we've had three this year, really two that played. Yeah. Um, but if each team can get one, that yeah. would be. I, I would like that as well. 
Okay, now our all NBL teams. Where do you want to start with this one? All NBL teams. Uh, this is. Let's go. To the first team. Yep. Off you go. Have we got yours? Obviously, you've got Bryce Cotton, Lamar Patterson. I'm going to go Nick K, yep. Cam Oliver, and Scott Machado. Yeah, uh, the only one I've got different is Jason Tate instead of Nick K. Yeah. Apart from that, I've got the same four. What about your Look, second a few team? Week, a few weeks ago, I would have said Jason Tate. Yep. Um, but I just think Nick K, especially with Tariqa White being a bit quiet as of late, he's really mm-hmm. stepped up his game. And, no, he has. you know, for a guy that, uh, you know, I love Jay Sean Tate. I love what he brings for Sydney as well. So that one could go either way for me as well. Yep. Or you could throw Mitch Creek in there. Yep. I think he's, uh, you know, if he'd been healthy all season, I think probably the last six weeks he's been he hasn't been a hundred percent and obviously yeah. got injured on the week the weekend and then and i think that that kind of hurts him but the way he was playing first half of the season i could i could see him in that four spot as well well i've got both both mitch creek and nick k in my all second team i've also got dj newbel scott hobson and casper ware what have you gone with yeah i would go i would go casper ware dj newbel uh, Mitch Creek, and then yeah, Jay Sean Tate, and then I might throw in Daniel Johnson at the five. Yeah, um, I think Daniel he's just Johnson been re- the one that I had a hard time leaving out. Yeah, I think he's had a really good year. I, I you know, at the start, I thought he was a little bit up and down, but I think he's been pretty solid. Um, and to me, I think his his consistency kind of hurts him in these awards because people just kind of expect. I mean, yeah. the guy's going to get seventeen and eight. So if uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that you just know, Daniel Johnson, he's gonna he's gonna get buckets and he's gonna get rebounds and he's gonna be uh, a score and a presence out there on the court. And sometimes when you do it for that long, it kind of hurts you in in these scenarios because. He almost probably gets a little bit forgotten about in, in, in some ways and obviously forgotten about on the national team as well. Well, I think we've pretty much got the same 11 players. It's just that Daniel Johnson was the unlucky one for me to miss out and who did you end up not having? Scotty Hobson was probably the unlucky one that you ended up not going with. Yeah, the other one I would kind of throw in there and probably because he's got a, a really good first name, Sean Long. Um, <laughs> The yeah. fact that he's just so talented, I, I, the, you know, it, can Melbourne get into the finals? Possibly helps them. But well, I, if, you know, he, if, I he two, if he has two big games this weekend to get them into the playoffs, he's got a really good case. Yeah, but I, I think the votes have already been tallied, so, so yeah. it's not uh, it's not a case where it, it can help them this weekend. But no. you know, if you're looking at one guy that can just take over a game whenever he wants, he's that guy. Um, he, he's, he, I would say him and Bryce Cotton from a pure talent point of view are the most talented players in the NBL. Now we'll find out on Sunday night, how our, how our predictions stack up. I think you can watch it live on ESPN on Sunday night. So once you, once you know all the playoff possibilities and the top four set, tune into that and, and check it out on Sunday night. You're not heading across, are you sure? I'm not heading across. No, I will be uh, glued to watch it as well and ticking Mm. off. Hopefully, quite a few correct uh, <laughs> correct answers, but we can dissect yeah. that and see if uh, yeah. if the NBL got it wrong on next week's show. Absolutely. Another bit of exciting news: ID Athletic has been one of our partners all all season long on on here on Hoops Heaven, and they have been kind enough to now donate a full set of singlets, which they will design and print for. For a, for a team that's listening to this show. So whether you're a social team or a, a junior club or whatever you are, um, all you have to do is make the best case possible that you need a, a new set of, of basketball singlets. So what we want you to do is follow us on our social media media channel. So you can find us on, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Send us a photo of the playing uniforms you're currently playing in and tell us how badly you want a new set of of basketball singlets. And then on the last show of the season, Sean, you'll pick the winner and we'll announce which team will be getting a brand new, freshly designed, freshly made set of basketball singlets thanks to ID Athletic. Now that's not a that's not a cheap prize. If you were a basketball team going to go and buy your own own set of, of singlets, that wouldn't be a cheap exercise. So this is something something pretty kind to be donated by ID Athletic to our listeners here on Basketball Hustle. Yeah, 
it is. And, uh, you, you know, I'm at basketball stadiums uh, on a on a nightly basis, and I see some pretty bad uniforms out there. So, uh, you know, whether you're a junior team playing on a, on a Saturday morning comp or, you, you know, you're a, a, an older team and playing on a Monday night comp up at, up at Bendat Basketball Center, if you need – a new uh, new set of unis to make your team uh, always say you look good, you play good. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, if your game needs to step up another level and you need the uniform, ID Athletic will, will take care of you. They've uh, they've done some some good jerseys for, for my academy and also my, my son's team, the Redditch Rockets. So mm-hmm. it's uh, they, they look good out there. And it's, uh, you know, it, that's a fantastic opportunity to get some get some new uniforms. So thanks to ID Athletic for uh, coming on board. Absolutely. So just follow us on our social media channels and we'll give you more details and just get your ent- entries in and, and Sean will be the man that picks picks the winner come the end of the season. Let's keep moving now, Sean, because we've got a massive final round of the NBL regular season. It couldn't be couldn't be better place with every game having, having some sort of playoff implications. And it all starts Thursday night, Melbourne Arena. Melbourne United have to win. The Cairns Taipans have plenty of motiv- motivation to win as well, and they're also the form team of the competition. Who have you got? Well, I've got Melbourne United because there's just so much riding on it. They're at home, but they haven't beat Cairns yet this season. No, no. So they've been a bit of a bogey team. They haven't figured out the Scott Machado and Cam Oliver, DJ Newbel connection yet, but I think they, they will get there. And, and as talented as they are, got a lot like Chris Golding will uh, will step up, have a huge game. And, you know, they've been bringing Melo Trimble off the bench the last mm-hmm. few weeks and it actually has helped respond and he's played much better. So I expect Melbourne United to get this one, but it's going to be a fun one to watch. Now, if it goes that way, that puts the pressure back on the New Zealand Breakers when they play the South East Melbourne Phoenix in Christchurch on Friday. That'll The Breakers just have to win and win by as many as they possibly can and then hope that Melbourne loses one of their last two games as well. So what are you expecting from the Breakers against the Phoenix? Yeah, well, I expect the Breakers to win. Um, obviously, Melbourne or Southeast Melbourne Phoenix are, are missing a few of their stars. And, uh, and I expect them to win big as well. I think that they, you know, they're going to try and run the score up and, uh, and they need to, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting if these two teams, especially the breakers and Melbourne United, if it comes down to it, if they go back and watch some of those games earlier in the year, mm-hmm. when did they put their bench on at the end of a game? You know, did they, even if they were losing, did they, how did they play those end of game scenarios? Cause that's a different, could be the difference between playing in the playoffs or sitting, or sitting at home. So Absolutely. It, because right now there's it, only six points between them. Melbourne are six points ahead of New Zealand, so it's going to be really tight if they both end up on, on 15 wins come, come Sunday. Um, Friday night, Sydney Kings hosting the Illawarra Hawks, top against bottom. Any chance of an upset? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, that one's, you know, Illawarra Hawks have, you know, they fought pretty hard, but they just don't have the horses um, at the moment to be able to compete for over 40 minutes, you know, that you see it in stretches. And, uh, you know, I think the Sydney Kings, they know they need to get that one to a sure top spot. We already do think they already have it, but I, I think they'll, uh, they'll get that one against Illawarra. And to start off on Saturday, Brisbane Bullets hosting the Cairns Taipans. Well, that's a, that's an interesting. One. I think Brisbane's going to get that one just because they've got uh, Cairns playing that second game yeah. of the weekend, and uh, you know Brisbane's got a lot. They still got a chance, so they'll, they'll know a little bit more going into that one. But uh, you know, I expect Brisbane. They've been playing good. I think they were a bit unlucky against New Zealand. They had that one, and then uh, against the Wildcats, they ran out of gas. So I expect them to to get that one and win seven of their last nine potentially. And it's usually that gets you, gets you into the finals, but I don't think it'll be enough this year. Perth Wildcats then host the Adelaide 36ers. All, all likelihood it'll be the last game coaching for Joey Wright in the NBL and it also doubles as his 500th game coaching in the league. So massive achievement that will be. Any chance of them coming to Perth and just playing without any sort of consequences or fear of consequences and and upsetting the Wildcats? Well, there's one team you don't want to play that's kind of playing fearless is the Adelaide 36ers because they can put points on the board and, and how quickly they play. They, they, they've got that talent. You know, Jerome 
Randall that can just shred defenses when he puts his mind to it is a is a scary thing. It's a uh, an interesting one for me as well. Tariqa White didn't really look too healthy um, last Saturday. You know, I know he's kind of been in and out um, of the lineup, but to me, he had a little bandage around his leg as well, just below his knee. So I'll be surprised how the Wildcats play that one as well. Are they going to probably use him sparingly? And uh, and he's he's a big key. I think you know he's going to have to be firing for them to get a championship. So uh, that would be interesting to see how the Wildcats play that one as well. To me, I mean, the result's probably not going to matter, but I think it's a really important game for Damien Martin to play some good minutes and there's no better preparation for a playoffs than chasing around Jerome Randall for 30 minutes. And I think it's important Miles Plumley really gets to have a good run out there and sus to, to play a more important role too. So I think it's important for those two players probably more than more than anybody. Yeah, I think the Wildcats will get that one, but uh, those are good points. You know, get a few more game minutes under Damian Martin and Miles Plumley just got to... You know, as smart a player as they're saying saying he is, he's just got to stop doing those silly fouls. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the third one he picked up in that third quarter where he's just grabbing a guy when he's going for a rebound, he had no chance to get it. That's the ones they've got to eliminate. You know, you're going to get picked up on. The season and the round finishes, Melbourne United, the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix, this could either be the deadest of deadest rubbers or we could have three teams all, all sweating on, on the result and the margin that Melbourne wins by. Do you think Melbourne wins and it's just a matter of the margin and what it means? Yeah, I think Melbourne wins by 30 plus mm-hmm. on that one. Um, mm-hmm. Having to play down south of New Zealand, come back, play a meaningless game for the Phoenix. I think uh, the Mel- Melbourne United is going to be motivated and that's going to get them into the finals. That's my prediction. Okay. But as we know with NBL basketball, <laughs> anything can happen. Absolutely. But yeah, we, we all can't wait to find out how it happens. This was a, a really f- full show of Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. I hope you all enjoyed it. Great to have an interview with Mika Vakona. I hope you all enjoyed that. Don't forget to get your entries in for the ID Athletic singlet competition for your team. Um, we had a look at all the award winners, all the ram- ramifications for playoffs this weekend. Plenty going on this week, Sean. What can you leave us leave us with? Thanks to our sponsors this year. I've had a really a lot of fun with with the podcast and and thank you Pikey for uh being involved as well it's uh it's been a lot of fun but you know this doesn't happen unless we have uh hoop seven id athletic devlin so uh, go out and support those who support us and uh, i'm looking forward to next week and seeing how this weekend has unfolded Bye, have a great time.